The scene opens with Senator Stern inviting Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes to the chamber. Tony Stark, along with everyone else, is surprised to hear the name of Iron Man's BFF, whom Tony affectionately calls Rhodey, a fan-favorite character played by Oscar nominee Terrence Howard, who literally told us he would put on the suit next time in Iron Man 1. But when it was time for Iron Man 2, everyone was even more surprised when Rhodey suddenly looked like Oscar nominee Don Cheadle. And the only way to handle this mega recasting is to just address it right away and move along. And that is exactly what the clever magic makers at Marvel did in the most meta of ways possible. Look, it's me. I'm here. Deal with it. Let's I move on. I, I just... I drop, drop it. it. All right. I'll drop it. But why was Terrence Howard, star of Iron Man 1, subtracted from Iron Man 2? And according to Mr. Howard, 1 times 1 equals 2. You see, he developed his own math theory as to why everything you know about numbers is wrong. So how can 1 times 1 equal 1, Mr. Terrence Howard would ask? If 1 times 1 equals 1, that means 2 is of no value because 1 times itself has no effect. And if that doesn't make sense, neither does much of his life and career. It's a life and career of sporadic greatness featuring frequent inconsistencies and, uh, exaggerations? Well, lies? Untruths? So yeah, let's find out what the f**k happened to Terrence Howard. What the f**k happened to you, man? Huh? But to truly understand what the f**k happened to Terrence Howard, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1969, Chicago. He is the great-grandson of actress Minnie Gentry. She was a star of stage and screen, and you might know her from The Cosby Show. Great-grandmama Minnie raised little Terry Howard because his dad was in jail, because he stabbed somebody to death. Yeah, I've been, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Then why'd you talk? Yes, that's right. It was Terrence Howard's family that was involved in the notorious killing that the media dubbed the Santa Line Slaying in Ohio. Eyewitness accounts were not exactly consistent, so nobody really knows exactly what happened this infamous night, but it kind of went like this. A bunch of families were in line at the mall, waiting to sit on Santa's lap, the Howard family gets accused of cutting in line, and this leads to an argument with another family. This argument gets physical. Nobody's actually sure who started the fight, but Terrence Howard's dad ended it by stabbing the man to death. Terrence Howard said that his child eyes witnessed this killing, yet the story that he told Oprah doesn't exactly line up with facts. But it did happen. Many claim that witnessing this violent act from his father would lead Terrence to grow up to have a tendency towards violence and dangerous behavior. Hell no, no. So, like many actors, Terrence Howard got his start in television, the TV. At first, in 1992, with a few episodes on All My Children, before being cast as Jackie Jackson in the hugely popular ABC miniseries The Jacksons, An American Dream. From there, Howard had a stint on the short-lived sitcom Tall Hopes in 1993, which came and went the same year that Great Grandma Gentry died. But also that same year he appeared in his first movie, Who's the Man? while also juggling one-offs on shows like Living Single, Coach, and Family Matters. Unfortunately for Howard, 1993 also saw the engineering program at Pratt Institute shut down. Why is that a problem for him? Well, he would claim that he attended that school, which was a blatant lie that could easily be tracked down in the age of the internet on the World Wide Web. 
Oh yeah, Terrence Howard also claimed that he got a PhD in chemical engineering from South Carolina State University, even though that school doesn't offer a doctorate in that program and there's no record of him attending anyway. But he was given an honorary degree, so uh, whoop de doo congratulations, Terry. I work hard. I know how to work hard. I'm just not a school type of person. Disagree or not, 1995 was undoubtedly his breakthrough, with turns in Lotto Land and Dead Presidents, which is a pretty dang good movie, before delivering his first big screen performance of true substance as a football player who develops a passion for the marching band. In the film Mr. Holland's Opus, he left a genuine impact on the movie. It was excessively sentimental, sure, but it showed that this young man was capable of bigger roles. And that same year, he got behind the wheel in the O.J. Simpson story, playing the driver of the famed Ford Bronco freeway chase. This and a few other small roles helped him land a major role on the sitcom Sparks which debuted in 1996, giving Howard another notable series role. The same year that Sparks was canned, 1998, he also turned up in the movie Butter, the movie Spark, no relation to Sparks, and The Players Club, directed by Ice Cube. Yo, man, what if this cat wake up, man? What you think? We knock his ass back out. However, he would pad out the rest of the decade with Valkyrie Flake, Best Laid Plans, and his biggest breakthrough yet, The Best Man, in 1999. For his impressive standout performance as Free Spirit Quentin, which was not easy to stand out in this ensemble cast, Howard earned not only an NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Supporting Actor and various other Guild acknowledgments, but he would also earn an Independent Spirit Award nomination. I am a pimp. So my future looks mighty bright, thank you very much. Terrence Howard was king of the world, at least on TV when he was playing Cassius Clay, aka Muhammad Ali, in yes, King of the World, in the year 2000. Giving a commanding performance in a lackluster movie, a TV movie. Following a kind of funny turn in Big Mama's house, Howard would play another civil rights icon, Ralph Abernathy, in yet another TV movie, Boycott. Pulling in deserved praise. Then came the year 2001, which wouldn't be all good, as Howard would turn up in two poorly received movies, Angel Eyes and the Razzie Punchline, Glitter. Still, Howard was on the verge of mainstream breakout. He was almost a movie star. Whether at the center of a court martial in Hearts War, giving a powerful performance against Bruce Willis and Colin Farrell, or giving romance movies a whirl with something called Love Chronicles, or taking it to the streets in a motorcycle for a movie called Biker Boys, spelled with a Z in 2003, or working in the remarkable SAG-nominated cast of Ray. Terrence Howard was an undeniable presence in this wonderful biopic. Howard's character is soft-spoken and calm when necessary, yet hard and in your face when the scene demanded it. Uh, he about as green as a blade of grass. I can handle him. 2005 was Howard's most prolific year yet, and his most successful yet. There was The Salon, and Animal, and Get Rich or Die Trying. But none of this, or his future success, happens without two Academy Award winners, Crash and Hustle and Flow. But first came Crash, which uh, won Best Picture for some reason. It's fine, but was it the best? Uh, eh. But hey, they say it's the best, so yeah, uh, congratulations. Terrence Howard actually stood out amongst this amazing ensemble cast of characters who are all crashing into each other be because of racism. He is given many powerful moments in this movie Crash that are worthy of an acting highlight reel. 
just like his next film, the hip-hop gangster drama Hustle and Flow, which is perhaps the most memorable performance in his filmography. As a pimp-turned-rapper named DJ, Howard gives a nuanced, rich turn that landed him his only Oscar nomination. Yet. Proving to everyone that it actually is difficult out in that particular environment for a man who happens to work in the illegal sex trade. With the Oscar winning song, It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp. You know it's hard out here for a pimp when he's trying to get this money for the rent. That same year saw the HBO movie Lackawanna Blues. And he was good in that, too. Allegedly. Because we got some more fish to catch. Right, Doc? With an Oscar nomination in his pocket, Howard could land any movie that would have him. Like the 2006 musical Idle Wild, or the 2007 movie Pride, where he played a famed swim coach. He was in the hunting party, handling rather chaotic tonal shifts. There was the brave one, playing just fine against Jodie Foster. He was in the forgettable yet worthy effort, August Rush. And the slightly disappointing, heart-stopping medical thriller, Awake, which were all fine films, but felt like material we'd hope was below him at that time in his career, but you know, it's not. You sound like my ex-wives. 2006 was another reinventive year for Terrence Howard, being cast in Iron Man as James Rhodes with a salary of $3.5 million, making him, Terrence Howard, the highest paid actor in the entire cast of Iron Man. Yes, that included Robert Downey Jr because at the time, Robert Downey Jr. was not worth that much money and a very big risk. But it turns out casting Terrence Howard was the biggest risk. And you gotta remember, at this time, nobody gave a crap about Iron Man. Nobody knew what would become of this Marvel Universe. A cinematic Marvel Universe wasn't even on our minds at the time. This was just like, oh, it's a superhero movie, I guess, with a B-list, maybe even a C-list superhero. So yeah, joining the cast of a Marvel movie at that time wasn't the huge mega deal that it kind of is now. Of course, the massive success of Iron Man spawned a sequel with Marvel upping Robert Downey Jr.'s salary significantly, thus reducing Howard's $3.5 million salary to a mere 40 thousand dollars that's right forty thousand dollars which yeah that's that's really low for that thing. and made poor terrence feel like he was pushed out so i know you don't respect me I yeah, respect i'm just you. your babysitter and so you know when you need your diaper change thank you let me know but there was also a lot of talk that he was extremely difficult on the set of iron man one with neither director John Favreau nor the producers liking their experience with working with him. Later, Terrence would say, When all that stuff went down about me, you're not in any bargaining position. You're shunned. You're persona non grata. So what do you do when Terrence Howard is too expensive and too troublesome? Well, you bring in Don Cheadle. Oh my god, you crazy son of a bitch. <laughs> And Don Cheadle was so good that everybody kind of soon forgot about Terrence. Sorry, Terrence. But hey, at least now he had time to release his lousy vanity album called Shine Through It. And he would give Broadway a go in an all-black production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Except he was a jerk face there too, and was sued for five million dollars for assaulting the composer. Hey bitch, want to suck on this shit? And then it all came out. In 2009, it was revealed that Terrence Howard was arrested in 2001 
for assaulting and stalking his first wife, later pleading guilty to disturbing the peace, further admitting that he slapped her in front of their children. Also, his second wife filed a restraining order against him, claiming abuse. Howard signed, but it was later determined that it fell under blackmail, with his second wife threatening to release nude photos of him. And the year prior, he had been arrested for assaulting a flight attendant. So yeah, I guess Terrence Howard is difficult to work with, and difficult to be married to. Feels like an eternity in here. Can't seem to find my mode now. And at this time, his career could be called unremarkable, with a low-rent fighting movie cleverly called Fighting, which is about fighting. He had a small voice role in The Princess and the Frog. Later, he would go back to TV for the failed Law & Order spinoff, L.A. Then came the year 2011, which wasn't that good either, with the forgettable films Little Murder, The Ledge, and Winnie Mandela. None of these really hit the mark. And in all honesty, who cares who plays Nelson Mandela after Morgan Freeman, am I right? This was followed by 2012's On the Road adaptation, which I think is kinda underrated, and he would play an FBI agent in the movie The Company You Keep. Oddly, the year 2003 was sort of a mixture of his entire career. He had a light but chewy role in Dead Men Down, he did complete shite in the movie called Movie 43. He joined a pretty good ensemble cast in the movie The Butler. He did a sequel to The Best Man called The Best Man Holiday, which was a welcome return to the movie that launched him into the limelight. But he also had a really meaty, deep, dark, powerful performance in the movie Prisoners, which just came out of nowhere. Everyone is great in this movie. I wish Terrence Howard did more movies like Prisoners, oh my gosh. It reminded us how amazing this guy could be when you got the right script and the right director and the right co-stars. And despite what you think about me, I would die for my daughter. Then came his role as Lucius on the popular TV show Empire which started in 2015, and I think it's still going, even without Jussie. And yeah, Empire has given him his widest audience in nearly a decade. He plays a former drug dealer turned music entrepreneur. It resembles his role in Hustle and Flow to a degree, with a little mixture of Jay-Z thrown in there, I guess. It's a safe spot for Howard. The perfect role, actually. He is aware that his turn as DJ in Hustle and Flow earned him the most acclaim of his career. So he was probably like, I should do something similar to that in this Empire show. Well, yeah, that's the next logical step, and it worked so well. It works so well. Empire feels like it's Mr. Howard's opus. It would indicate a full resurgence for him, and yet, in the meantime, Howard hasn't built too much off of his rediscovered acclaim. The boost from Empire should have helped him in the movie industry, but the past few years, he's kind of spent it doing forgettable junk. Like Term Life, Cardboard Boxer, Triumph, and more. But again, as he has found himself doing, Howard has fallen back into the familiar. The material that he knows is best for him. Hence the TV series, The Best Man, The Final Chapters, playing his beloved character, Quentin, for the third time. Everywhere I turn, you're on a goddamn billboard, on a Twitter feed, on, on my TV screen, everywhere I look, you're like a damn ninja. And yeah, all those Marvel sequels that he missed out on, they went on to change and improve and destroy the art of filmmaking forever, depending on how you look at it, for better or worse. And they made, like, all the money in the multiverse, allowing Don Cheadle to fly and fight alongside all those superheroes, and they're, you know, all a part of that superhero life. And for some reason, Don Cheadle was nominated for an Emmy for what was basically just a cameo in The Falcon and The Winter Soldier, but that cameo Emmy nomination, it could have been Terrence's, but no. 
he screwed up, or Hollywood screwed him, I don't know, depends on how you look at it, but I guess the lesson here, ladies and gentlemen, is to not be difficult to work with. Because it's hard out here for a pimp, and it's hard out here for people working with Terrence Howard. Hey, get rid of them tears, my... No, cut them tears shit out, man. In December of 2022, Oscar nominee Terrence Howard announced that he would be retiring from acting forever. It's such a rare thing, even for an actor past his prime and respect, to call it quits. Especially at his age, he's still got plenty of time left, lots of good movies in there, maybe make some more of those prisoner movies. You're about to make a whole lot of people around here real happy, because that little stunt at the press conference, that was a doozy. But you know what? Terrence Howard, he did his thing, and uh, he did pretty good. He left his mark. So, you know what? It kind of makes sense for him to throw in the towel now and call it quits. What doesn't make sense is that one times one equals two, though. But yeah, nobody should give a f about what the f happened to Terrence Howard because he's doing just fine, considering.